for many years, uh, Gerald and Sandra, Gerald has passed away, but for many years they ha have operated the Utah Lighthouse Ministry out of the, their bookstore in Salt Lake City. They've together published innumerable titles, which I hope you have many of them in your library. Um, she runs a website, utlm.org, which has a vast catalog of resources on there, um, especially valuable I find is the Salt Lake City Messenger, the the, uh, the uh, regular newsletter that uh, Sandra publishes. If you're not a subscriber to that, I really encourage you to become one because she's um, tackling a lot of significant issues and current topics uh, in Mormonism. Things as things change. Have you noticed that things change in the LDS world? <laughs> Um, Sandra's really on top of those and, and, and giving, I think, insightful analysis and how to think about those issues in light of history and in light of scripture. And so that's a really valuable resource, the Salt Lake City Messenger. Um, but again, I think a, a significant part of, of her ministry is just talking to people. And as people explore leaving Mormonism, um, They'll just walk in the bookstore sometimes and, and just start a conversation. And so, again, she's been the first Christian contact for accounts of people leaving Mormonism. Now, whether they move on to Christianity is another question, and we'll talk about that. But I asked her to come out today and just um, converse with me about some things that she's learned in those years of conversation. So, um, here we are. So, um, Uh, we have a green light. Yeah, that's always good. We have the green light. We send her the green light today. I am technically today. challenged, so these on and off buttons are kind of hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> try, the, uh, try the on button. That's the very first thing. So, um, Sandra, why don't you just give us the five to ten minute version of, of your own story of leaving Mormonism? Ah, boy, that's hard. Um, Okay, my husband and I were both from fifth generation Mormon families, and I'm a direct descendant of Brigham Young. Uh, Gerald's family, the Tanners, go back to the early 1830s in Mormonism. So growing up, everyone we knew was Mormon. I, we were both born here in Utah, but I was raised in Southern California. Down in California, my parents, who had been married in the Salt Lake Temple, but down in California, my mother had started to have questions on Mormonism. And she read Fawn Brody's book, No Man Knows My History, that started her looking into the problems of the early beginnings of Mormonism and its truth claims. So when I was going to seminary in high school, she plied me with questions that got me in trouble at seminary because I'd asked this stuff. <laughs> Anyways, um, when I got into Institute of Religion, uh, I started asking the questions for my own interest, whereas in high school it was trying to find answers for my mother. Now I'm trying to figure it out myself, which got me in trouble. And the teacher told me I couldn't ask questions anymore because I was disturbing a girl that was thinking of joining the church. <laughs> and <laughs> it was in, at this time in God's providence that my grandma, who'd been visiting, uh, wanted to go back to Salt Lake and asked me if I'd go back on the bus to help her with her luggage. So I came back to Salt Lake, and my grandma was going through her mail and got a little card inviting her to a meeting and asked me to drive her over to it. And I reluctantly took her. And when I got up to the door, this real nice-looking young man answered the door, and his name was Gerald Tanner. And uh, so God dropped me off at Gerald's doorstep. Uh, <laughs> and here was a young man who had been a rebellious teen, uh, drinking and smoking behind the ward house with the boys that didn't want to go to priesthood meeting. But when he got to be 18, the bishop started hinting that it was time for him to get serious and go on a mission. Well, this launched Gerald into studying the beginnings of Mormonism. Did he believe it enough to go on a mission? Which he never went on the mission, but uh, that started him. And so he read the Book of Mormon, decided he believed that, and then he read the encyclopedia, and 
on Mormonism and found out there were splinter groups and he didn't know there were any other kind of Mormon. So he saw that there was a reorganized church here in Salt Lake. He visited them and met a man there that had a huge personal library of original Mormon books. And he started showing Gerald all the problem areas and changes in early Mormonism. So this launched Gerald into his research. Well, because of um, people in the late 50s, early 60s, there was no internet or anything like that. So how do you find other people that are studying? Well, you kind of all went through Zion's bookstore because at the back of Zion's bookstore was a little secret area of apostate literature. <laughs> and uh, so my grandma had been there and Gerald had been there and uh, so they had some mutual friendships. And so that's how my grandma got on his mailing list to tell about this little meeting at his folks' house, which his folks, uh, his dad, uh, had left Mormonism, but was atheist, but his mother was a devout Mormon and taking his sisters to the Mormon church. And she was horrified that Gerald was gonna have these apostate meetings at their house. So she took his sisters to see one of the seminary teachers to help fortify them against Gerald's uh, waywardness. And so here I am at this meeting and this nice young man is telling me all the stuff that my mom had said for years, that there were all kind of problems with the beginning of Mormonism. Now, Gerald had made two different trips back to Independence, Missouri in his jalopy to try to discover what the different splinter groups were and which one was true. So he's like Joseph Smith, what's the only true church? So uh, in his search, he came across a little group the Church of Christ Book of Mormon that rejected everything of Mormonism but the Book of Mormon. And through this little group, Gerald had become a Christian, but he was still hanging on to the Book of Mormon. So here he was at this meeting, real cute. You have to understand cute, okay? <laughs> uh, my whole life would have been different if this had been a middle-aged married guy. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I immediately got interested in the meeting, and uh, <laughs> afterwards I went up and I said, oh, well, that's really interesting. Why don't you come over to my grandma's and tell me more? <laughs> and Gerald was so excited. He came over with all these books and photocopies, and I'm like, really? Okay. <laughs> so anyways, uh, he finally got me to pay attention. And... Um, so he was telling me how Joseph Smith's revelations had been changed. So I went down to the bookstore and bought a current edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, and I bought a reprint of the 1833 Book of Commandments, which is the first printing of Joseph's revelations in book form. I went home and asked my grandma if she would read with me the Book of Commandments against the Doctrine and Covenants. Now, I did not appreciate how odd this was, that most grandmas probably wouldn't have thought this was a keen idea. Uh, I mean, my grandma was wearing her garments and everything, you know. Uh, well, I didn't know my grandma had read Fon Brody's book. So she had questions when I brought up this idea to her. Oh, sure, sounds like a great plan. Let's do that. So <laughs> we spent days reading the Book of Commandments against the Doctrine and Covenants. And the result of that was I thought the, the creator of the universe could have said the Revelations right the first time. Why would he have to go back two, three years later and reprint them and change the words? And that didn't make sense to me. And uh, well, with Gerald, meeting with Gerald, I mentioned to him, I'm a direct descendant of Brigham Young. And Gerald says, huh, um, have you ever read any of Brigham Young's sermons? And I'm like, no. And he says, well, let me bring you a few. <laughs> As a descendant, you really ought to read a few of his choice ones. You know? Well, okay, if there aren't too many. And um, so here's a sermon on uh, the only men who become gods are the ones that practice polygamy. Well, they don't teach that today. Uh, will we give up polygamy for statehood? Never. Well, that didn't work out. Uh, will the Civil War free the slave? No. Well, that one didn't work out either. Uh, Adam is our father and our God. And I thought, what? Uh, so that, that one didn't make it through correlation. They didn't teach that anymore. 
And uh, then he showed me blood atonement. And I don't know if you've read on blood atonement, but Brigham Young used to teach that there were certain sins you could commit that the blood of Christ wouldn't cover, like murder after you've been through the temple. And for that, you would have to have your own blood shed to atone for it. And Gerald had me read a sermon from the Journal of Discourses, and this is approximately what it says. Brigham says, suppose I found my brother in bed with my wife. I would immediately put a javelin through them both, and this would save them, and they would have exaltation, and I would be justified, and this is really what it means to love your neighbor. And then it goes further and says that there are certain sins you could commit that the blood of Christ won't cover. And when I read that sermon, my world fell apart. And I just sat there in shock, and I thought, God never told him to preach that sermon. Well, if God didn't tell the prophet of God to preach that sermon, then is he a prophet of God? So this was the beginning of my journey out of Mormonism and the beginning of Gerald's and my courtship, which all centered around studying Mormon history. Uh, <laughs> what a courtship. Um, <laughs> we had one spaghetti dinner at a restaurant. Other than that, it was all studying Mormonism. And... Uh, <laughs> so stupid now, but it, that's, you know, that's the way it went. And so along the way, Gerald's telling me that, well, see, you need to throw everything out and just believe the Bible and Book of Mormon because they teach there's only one God. And the Doctrine and Covenants teach many gods. The Bible and Book of Mormon say there's only heaven and hell. The Doctrine and Covenants says there's those three levels of heaven. And so Gerald's showing me the difference in these books to the other half of the script, Mormon scriptures. So I concluded, okay, scrap everything but the Book of Mormon. So we had a whirlwind romance and shocked everyone I knew that I was getting married to an apostate and um, we weren't getting married in the temple and I was having a Protestant minister marry us. You know, like what? And um, well, I have to tell you, I didn't know there were different kind of pastors. Uh, <laughs> I didn't realize not all of them were Christians. <laughs> I found out after this guy married us, he didn't even believe in the resurrection. <laughs> so I might as well had the bishop marry us as far as thinking I had a Christian <laughs> minister marrying us. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, you learn. So uh, we lived in California the first year of our marriage, and Gerald took me around to different churches hoping that I would realize what it meant to follow Christ. Finally, through listening to a Christian radio program one day in my home, I came to faith in Christ. But we still were hanging on to the Book of Mormon. And that took us another almost three years to deal with that because no one knew how to show us why the Book of Mormon couldn't be history. Why couldn't it be believed like the Bible? Ministers uh, all tried, the different churches would visit, the pastor would try to talk to us about Mormonism. And they, he would always start with, you know, well, they believe in plural gods, or they got this temple work, and, you know, those kind of areas. And we say, fine, I don't believe that. I just believe the Book of Mormon. Well, the pastors didn't know enough about Mormonism to explain to us why the Book of Mormon couldn't be uh, scripture. They just knew this general theology of Mormonism, which we had rejected. So it wasn't until we moved back to Salt Lake that we met people that had studied the Book of Mormon enough to show us why it didn't make it historically. Uh, there's no artifacts, no language, no people group, no location, no map. And people uh, that we now met could show us the difference between biblical archaeology and the lack of it for the Book of Mormon. So finally, we set aside the Book of Mormon as well. But during this process, all our family and friends said that we were crazy. We're just two young, dumb kids. Uh, and we hadn't proven our point. And so we would write up little pamphlets with all our little research and give them out to everyone we knew. I sent them to the ward mailing list. Uh, how to win friends and influence people. Uh, <laughs> I mean, well, it's just. Well, like I say, two dumb kids, you know, we didn't know we weren't supposed to do this stuff. And we thought everyone would want to know. <laughs> and they didn't. <laughs> 
wow, I wanted to know. How come you guys don't want to know? Uh, and my mom, who had started this all, she was upset because becoming a Christian, I was leaving my Mormon heritage so that it was one thing to not believe, but it's another to leave. And uh, I mean, we had our names taken off. Well, back in the in 59 and 60, you didn't get your name taken off. You had to be excommunicated. It was the only way you could get your name off the rolls. And so we both went to our church courts uh, for our excommunications. But my mom and those in the family that didn't believe Mormonism would say to us, well, why take your name off? What does it make? Just go with it, you know, just drop out, become inactive, but you don't have to leave. Because they knew that if I took that extra step, I was making a cut in my relationships that was much deeper than just becoming inactive. And I had to tell my family, but I don't want people to think of me as just a dropout Mormon. I want them to know that I'm a Christian and I'm not trusting in Mormonism. So that, uh, those of you that left, you know the kind of problems this makes in your family. I had all kind of arguments with my grandparents. Uh, my dad, who had been inactive, suddenly woke up and starts arguing for priesthood. Uh, so it was, it was very hard. The first year out of Mormonism, it seemed like all I did was cry. Because every time I got around any family, it was just butting heads. Well, we moved back to Salt Lake to do more research through the libraries here. And we just kept putting out bigger and bigger research pamphlets to prove that Mormonism didn't meet its claims. Well, it grew into industry. <laughs> And we ended up writing books and having a bookstore and spending our whole life researching on this. Uh, but it all started because two dumb kids raised their hand and asked questions. So That's awesome. So you mentioned a couple of things that were pivotal for you in terms of the issues, mm -hmm. uh, Brigham Young and some of the history stuff. Um, you want to just kind of focus for us along with those things, what, are, what were the key issues for you guys that shook your faith in the LDS Church? Well, it was seen that Joseph Smith's revelations had been revised. We started reading books on the Bible and started understanding the process of translation, uh, background archaeology and history for the Bible. And we started to see the difference in that Mormonism didn't have that kind of support and underpinning for it. Uh, it was seeing all of the doctrines of Mormonism change through the years, that how could this be the work of God? Of course, polygamy entered into it. How could you have such a crazy idea? Uh, obviously, the church moved away from it. <laughs> uh, so there was, it was all of those kinds of areas. By believing the Book of Mormon on her kind of backing out of Mormonism, it made me accept a lot of Christian doctrine earlier than maybe a lot of other people leaving Mormonism would have, because by reading the Book of Mormon, I realized it taught just one God. So I didn't struggle with the Godhead like a lot of Mormons do leaving, <laughs> because of going through this circuitous route through the Book of Mormon that only teaches one God. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So. How are, I mean, as you, people come into the bookstore today, how are the issues that contemporary Mormons wrestling with, how are they similar and how are they different from those, you know, the things you guys wrestled with originally? Well, because we ride on all these issues, uh, a lot of the people I see are coming out for the same reasons we did. Uh, we just have more research on it now than when we first started looking at it. Uh, in recent years, the uh, research that was done on the Book of Abraham was a major factor in a lot of people coming out. In the 80s, it was mainly the Mark Hoffman murders and the fact that the brethren didn't see that he was a fraudster, and Gerald did, so it was kind of a man bites dog story, not what you're expecting. 
for Gerald to come out and say the guy's a fraud. Because people would have expected mm -hmm. you guys to the support it. To, yeah, right. Because it because it because if you guys remember the Mark Hoffman salamander letter forgery because it was critical of the church. Right, and everyone would have expected us to jump on board and say, yay, our team, we got proof Joseph's uh, involved in magic. And Terrell says, sorry guys, I don't think it's an authentic letter. And when it came out that it wasn't authentic and Mark did a couple of murders, then the couple of, uh, three major paperbacks were written on the Mark Hoffman case in the 1980s that showed Gerald was the first one to question the documents. And this changed our world because up till then the Mormons all were sure we were liars and evil bad people. And when they saw that Gerald was the only one with discernment to see that Mark's documents were frauds, we had people just pouring into our bookstore saying, okay, I'm ready to listen to the other side of the story now. But nowadays uh, with the internet, it is so easy to find problem areas of Mormonism, and then who do you talk to? So the people that go on the internet, they find these troubling questions, they find out about me, now that Gerald's dead, they find out about me, and they come into the bookstore to talk to me. So I have Mormons come in every week to talk to me about their struggles with, what do I do now? Uh, can I still believe? Is there some way to find answers to all these things? So like you said, I'm many times the first uh, ex-Mormon that they may talk to, which is very scary for them. Uh, and the, uh, people always say to me, you're not anything like I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> because they all have me pictured as some sort of witch. And, <laughs> and they come and say, well, geez, you're not scary. <laughs> I said, that's the sneaky part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you haven't fooled with your kindness, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people, you know, I think we're all aware that a lot of people as they're leaving Mormonism are opting for atheism or at least yes. agnosticism. Right. Um, why did you and Gerald choose not to reject all faith as you exited Mormonism? I think we both had a desire for God and we had each had spiritual experiences in our life that had helped us to hang on to a basic idea that there was a, a God, a power out there. And uh, many of these other Mormons have too and I don't know why they walk away from it so quickly uh, and doubt it, but we never doubted there was a God. We just didn't know who he was. Right, and he had to be different than the yeah. picture that you grew yeah. up with. Yeah, but he was real. So I'm curious about, you know, many are, like I said, are choosing the pathway of atheism. Mm -hmm. What are some other directions that people end up going as they, after they encounter you? And, and they're working this through, and obviously you're one voice in their life, but what are some of the different directions or the options that people end up choosing after they leave Mormonism? Well, besides the atheist or agnostic route, they go into New Age stuff. Some women go into uh, Wicca. <laughs> right. Uh, and they're looking for some, if they don't go atheist, they're looking for some sort of spiritual experience that is not tied to any church. Um, that's not really Christian. It's just warm, fuzzy spiritual stuff or something. Right, and it doesn't have... Uh an authoritarian hierarchy right. associated with right. it, right? Yeah. Uh, Mormons that are realizing the brethren misrepresented things to them have a knee-jerk reaction against any kind of authority, any kind of leadership, any church, because they don't want to be fooled again. They don't want someone to control them again. They don't want to be uh, led down a blind path uh, which is why most of them will look for a non-denominational church because they're looking for something without a hierarchy of a big church umbrella. Mm -hmm, they right. want this kind of independent sort of approach to mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a struggle for them, though, because our services are so different than uh, the ward. Uh, it's, it is a real culture shock. And so... I, 
Yeah, I let's try talk, to let's talk about them that. For so, that. so what are kind of, what are the kind of kind of things that you are telling people to prepare for? the culture shock of Christianity. Okay, so I may give them a list of churches or I may tell them some uh, several churches in their area, whatever. And I said, but now if you visit them, I want you to know ahead of time, don't go in your suit. <laughs> Uh, I mean, not that anyone would care that you came in a suit, but you're going to be uncomfortable because you're going to be the only person there that's wearing one, and you're going to stand out like a sore thumb. Everyone's going to know a Mormon visited church today. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just advise you, don't wear your suit. Uh, and you have to be prepared for them having a band. This is a real hard thing for uh, someone straight out of a ward that's quiet, boring, <laughs> stayed, nothing unusual happens, and you can hardly get anyone to sing. And even the fast songs are slow. Yeah. <laughs> There's one tempo. Yes. Our choir leader at my ward would just plead with people to sing, please, you know. And, and here they come in, and all the Christians are all over the place, and, I, you know, they're going to be waving, they might be clapping, and uh, the pastor's going to be in uh, his cutoffs or something, and maybe <laughs> flip-flops, you know, you just don't know. And, and it's going to look irreverent. Uh, but it's not. You have to see past that, that, that there's a heart for God there, even though it doesn't look like what you picture church looks like. They picture everyone's in suit and ties, and it looks like Easter, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and it's all choir music, you know, organ and all of that, and it's probably not going to be that, you know, but it is hard. People tell me that it's hard visiting another church. When I first went to another church in California, of course it's California, that's weird anyways, but... <laughs> This is back in, in uh, 1960, and this lady's sitting in front of me, and she's in a spaghetti strap sundress. And I'm like, oh, my word, can you believe this, that someone would come to church like that, you know? Uh, and they had coffee in the lobby. It was just, it was just absolutely, you know, wow, uh, Sin City. <laughs> So, and, we, and back then it was still music would have sounded like the Mormons as far as that goes. They had an organ and stuff. But the, but the look of people was casual. Uh, so it, and in today, it's even more of a shock than when I left. So it's hard. Yeah, it's even more casual and all the rest. So that is good. That's interesting. Um, so back to the, the question of, so we have some people agnostic atheists some people into sort of new age spirituality or self-styled spirituality some people do end up seeking a relationship with Jesus um, why do you think so many people nowadays are moving toward atheism and, and agnosticism in spite of you know maybe their posit maybe their religious experiences they even had um, what, why do you think that what what trends or kind of what factors are making that such a appealing destination the more active you were as a mormon generally speaking the more anger you're going to have when you leave because you invested yourself more in it and the deception to you is more profound and when you've gone through that deeper hurt I, I compare it to like finding out that your mate was running the local brothel and you're so shocked over this that your divorce is so messy that you can't love again, or at least not for a long time. And it's very much the same kind of attitudes when you come out of Mormonism. If you were deeply hurt by it, you aren't ready to love again. You aren't ready for that church relationship again. You can't trust again. And I tell people it takes time to get over that hurt or that anger. Uh, and you may have given up a lot of things for Mormonism. So it makes the cut even deeper in you when you find out it wasn't true. So I think that's why uh, the, the more you got hurt by it, the harder it's going to be for you to believe anything again. Right. Once burned, twice shy. Right. Yeah. So, so you mentioned 
the idea of sharing with idea people the idea of patience. Yeah. Uh, what else would maybe you advise someone who's maybe leaning toward or toying with that? I know a lot of people end up. It seems like anecdotally end up going through at least an atheist phase, yeah. but come out of it at some point. Right. But what what kind of advice do you give to someone who is maybe leaning toward just rejecting faith at wholesale? Well, I try to encourage them to uh, read some books on the uh, formation of the New Testament canon, the preservation of the New Testament, to get a little more background of why Christians still hang on to it, to why they haven't walked away from it all like the atheists have. And many of the Mormons have never considered taking that second look. They uh, just, they're through with Mormonism, they're through with everything. And I encourage different people that just as you've now seen that the church leaders misrepresented Mormonism to you, I would challenge you that they also misrepresented Christianity to you. Yeah. Yeah. And just as you took a, you're now taking a second look at Mormonism, you need to take a second look at Christianity. Because what you think you know about the Bible and Christianity is tainted by Mormonism. Uh, and if, give it another chance. Yeah, that's really wise. That's thoughtful. Now, you mentioned the anger. Yeah. Especially the deeper invested they are. What, as you, as you talk to people, along with that, what are the kind of emotional challenges that, that you've heard people voice to you as they're exiting? Well, besides the anger issue, there is uh, the sense of... Um, loss of how do I tell my family or I already told my family <laughs> and uh, they've disinherited me or cut me off. My kids can't come over to play with my brother's kids now. You know, there's just all sorts of hurt that come from this. Well, like I mentioned earlier, my first year, year out of Mormonism, it just seemed like I cried all the time because it was always this... <sighs> How could you do this to us? How could you ruin your family? How could you break up our eternal union? Uh, guilt. Everyone kept pushing guilt on me all year long. And I didn't have any Christian friends. I didn't have anyone to turn to. I didn't have any mentor. I was out there, dumb young married girl, didn't know zip, you know, and I just trying to struggle through all this. So we all need to be showing friendship and acceptance to those that are struggling and to have the patience that as they try to work through these issues, they aren't gonna see everything at once. They aren't gonna understand everything at once. I bet most of you didn't understand it all at once. And we tend to forget sometimes after we've been out a while, we didn't just accept it all right off the bat either. It was a process. And we have to have the patience with our family and friends that are going through the process. Uh, people will say to me, how come they can't see? And I said, well, how long did it take you to see? Did you accept that right off the bat? Well, no. <laughs> well, you can't expect your family to either. <laughs> right. I think that's really true. I think that's very wise. Now, you mentioned, you mentioned loss, and that's really interesting to me. So I'd like to maybe elaborate on that a little bit together. Um, Let's think about what are some of the people lose family connections, mm -hmm. they lose relationship connections. Somebody, I don't remember who shared this with me yesterday, but uh, last night, but the idea of you lose your special place in the universe, you go from, somebody said, from hero to zero. Yeah. Yeah, where you're, you know, you're a god in embryo and, and maybe a priesthood holder and suddenly now you're a sinful worm, you know. Um, <laughs> That, that's hard to lose a sense of my heritage and my yeah. family stories and lore and my place in the community. And so um, any other thoughts on like, like some of the sense of loss that people face? Well, when I was 16, I had my, or 15, whatever it was, I got my patriarchal blessing. And when, and then after the patriarch gave me my blessing, then they mail it out to you, at least back then, they mailed it later to me. And the day that came in the mail, it was so exciting. This was like God had sent me a letter. 
And I was home alone, and I went in the front room and read that letter and just cried. Isn't this wonderful? I am the special child of God with this great destined future. One of the funny things in it is it says uh, that my home will be adorned with the products of my own creation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he thought of books, but <laughs> back then Mormon women were all busy making purple grapes or something for their coffee table. <laughs> oh, I remember that. Yeah, out of marbles. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, but yeah, so that when you have those different kind of things happen and as you grow up in Mormonism, it, it gives you this sense of uh, of the specialness you hold in the world uh, that, that we are God's people. And in a, liter a literal way, I remember in college, I sat next to this Jewish guy who was really cute. And uh, you can tell I was very deep. <laughs> this is psychology. And here's this darling Jewish guy next to me who didn't give me the time of day and I thought, oh, if he only knew I was really Jewish. Uh, <laughs> because my patriarchal blessing said I'm from Ephraim, right? You know, so I'm really Jewish. And if he only knew, he'd probably look at me. <laughs> it's a good thing I didn't try to tell him. <laughs> yeah, he might look at you all right. Uh, I yeah. thought about it, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. So. I remember, I, I never got a patriarchal blessing. All my brothers and sisters did. That's, I'm sure that's why I left the church. Must apostatized. be, there you are. <laughs> but, so I, I didn't have that special blessing. Um, yeah, so I think that's good to be aware of the loss issue, and we're gonna face that as part of the journey. The emotional well, issues are part of the journey. See, now I didn't have the situation of getting married in the temple, mm. but people that have, this is a real loss they face or a real fear they face. You mean I won't be married? I won't have my mate? And this holds them back from leaving Mormonism because of their, they had, it, heaven to them was this eternal marriage relationship and they would lose this. So that's hard for people that have been counting on it to face that that won't be a part of heaven. Right, yeah. That, that really leads to my next question, really, because I'm curious about um, your observations about what are the toughest doctrinal issues that people choke on or grapple with. And, you know, the afterlife is certainly one of them. I think the preexistence is related to yes. that. And, but what are some, let, let's talk about some of the doctrinal challenges that people have a hard time either giving up or accepting. Trinity would be probably the hardest one to deal with. Yeah. Um, for me, it wasn't in this. Well, we backed out through the Book of Mormon, so mm -hmm. we were modalists. <laughs> for those who know theological terms, we were modalists at first and gradually came into to the Trinity mm -hmm. through that route. Most Mormons don't go that kind of route. They go straight from uh, plural gods to have to narrow it down to just the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But Trinity is one of the really hard ones. Pre-existence, uh, marriage for eternity, uh, the connection of family. Mm, yeah. The idea that there isn't three levels of heaven. Yeah, I've noticed that too. But that, that's a, a challenging for people emotionally mm -hmm. to realize that my grandparents who are passed mm -hmm. away does that mean they're not going to heaven? Yeah. You know, what does that mean for, for my, for my uh, family members eternally? That, that's challenging right. conceptually and emotionally. Yes, and I put to them, we don't get to pick and choose what we believe. We ha if we're going to be Christians, we have a manual, and it's called the New Testament. And so whatever we're going to believe has got to be in there. If it's not in the manual, then it's not going to be part of the picture. Um, as far as what happens to our families in the past, I have to leave that with God because it's, it doesn't matter how I feel about it. It's going to be whatever way God's going to do it. And it's past my ability to do anything about it. The baptism for the dead isn't going to work for anybody. And I just have to leave that with the Lord. We know 
what's required of us. We know what God said for us to do. That's the area we can have uh, a chance to change the outcome. And we have to leave the dead with God. And I don't make a judgment call on their families to say, oh, well, your dad went to hell or your grandparents went to hell. That's with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I say, let's make sure you aren't going there <laughs> uh, and leave the rest to God. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the Trinity is really tough. I mean, it's, it's tough for all of us, mm -hmm. conceptually. Right. But, I mean, I, I, don't, I can't explain how it works, how mm -hmm. God can be one God in three, eternally in, existing in three persons. I can explain the biblical basis mm -hmm. for why we believe it. Right. But I can't, I can't satisfy anybody's intellectual desire to know how it works. Um, one of the things I remind the Mormons is they can't explain their God either. Great point. I mean, God's got a wife, at least one, and maybe a lot. Uh, and he's got grandparents and great-grandparents. He's got in-laws. And he's got brothers all over the universe also running their worlds. I mean, how do you explain all that? So who's the first God? Mm -hmm. If every God's got a mom and dad, where do you get the first one? And they tell us there wasn't a first one. There's this eternal, infinite regression of gods. Well, how are they giving me a picture of God that is easier to understand right. than the right. Trinity? It's not right. that they had an easy answer and I got a difficult one. They got a difficult one. Just difficult in different ways. In different yeah. ways. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. and then I always remind people that God is infinite and I'm finite and I will I expect there to be certain things about God that I can't grasp. And right. instead of instead of heartburn, that brings me to a place of worship before yeah. this infinite God. But I also say, you know, that the Trinity is really the only view of God, the only thing that, that takes into account everything that God has revealed about himself in Scripture. Right. So that that helps me. It doesn't help me understand it. Yeah. Let me explain it to some extent. One, one, go ahead, Sandra. Go ahead. Uh, when I think about the differences here, in Christianity, God, one God who is infinitely existing as God. The Mormon view is there's an infinite number of beings becoming gods for all eternity. So it's a totally different concept. And scripture has nothing that backs up an idea of an infinite number of beings that are going to become gods. It's all through the Bible that there's only one God who's eternally existed. Right, and so I think you pointed out a minute ago that with some of these doctrines, there is an emotional connection, so there's a sense of loss. Yeah. A sense of loss of um, eternal marriage or eternal family and so forth. Um, and I think part of what I'm trying, what I try to do when I'm sharing with people is to show them that really what they're, they're gaining, there's, there's gain to follow the biblical. It's not like you step down from varsity right. <laughs> to junior varsity idea of heaven. Yeah. But, but this, this picture of heaven that we get where there isn't marriage is, yeah. but there, there's so much more. Right. right. So. And then, and then I also like to make fun of the, <laughs> sorry, uh, the idea that like, so if you're sealed to your parents and you're sealed to your kids, who are you actually with? So like, we can't even figure out where to spend Christmas. Yeah. Whose in-laws to go to, you know, so I don't know how they do it in eternity. Right. And this gets back to the problem of polygamy, which the church today won't talk about. But the president of the Mormon church today is... Uh, a widower from his first wife has remarried in the temple, and if Mormonism were true, he would be a polygamist in heaven. That's what he's looking forward to. The next guy up is Dallin Oaks. He outlived his first wife, is, has remarried in the temple, and he would be looking forward to having both wives in eternity. So polygamy is not a dead issue, and in fact, it's something that many women today in Mormonism are struggling with. Because they know if they die first, their husband may remarry, and it will mean polygamy for them. And this scares them. There's a whole book out on the ghost of polygamy, for, written by a Mormon lady, talking about the struggle that many Mormon women are having with this concept. 
And so then the church leaders just say, oh, well, God will work it out. You don't need to worry about it. It'll all be fine. Well, but how can it be fine? My great-grandpa had five wives and children. It is a, a difficult thing. How are you going to have these five different families not be with the father? Does that mean four of these women are gonna, not going to have a Mormon family for all eternity? Obviously, they were all counting on being a family with that husband for all eternity. Brigham Young had 55 wives and children. Who, how do you divide this all up? If there isn't going to be eternal union for each of those women, then what have they bought into? It's a false hope for them. It's a very confusing doctrine. Then in today's world, you got yours, mine, and ours where you have divorced couples that were sealed in the temple, they get divorced and they get remarried and maybe remarried in the temple, more kids. How do you make any of this work? And it just becomes an impossible mess. Yeah, point, I think point being for us is that um, those emotional connections to those those doctrinal ideas really that thinking help thinking those through and realizing that what what the bible has is also is emotionally satisfying and it's true and so well, yeah. i like to think of heaven in the sense of like if you go to a symphony or something like that where where you're so wrapped up in the music and enjoying the experience you're glad that you have your family with you in the pew but your focus isn't on your family mm -hmm. the focus is on the symphony mm -hmm. so heaven to me is the idea that it will be god and i will be sitting there glad that my loved ones are with me but they aren't the focus it's God. Mm -hmm. And until you fall in love with God, heaven doesn't look that good to you as a Mormon because your heaven only included your family. It's when you fall in love with God that you say, wow, I get to be with God, the, the creator of the universe. People say, to me, oh, that sounds so boring just to be with God, you know. And I say, <laughs> Whoa. I've had Mormons yeah. say that to yeah. me. Uh, oh, boring, you know. And I said, the creator of the universe. Try to think of who, if you were going to be on a desert island, who would you want to be with? You would want to be with someone that was really interesting, right? I mean, how do you get more interesting than God? <laughs> so I think that's a fantastic thing to spend eternity with God. And I hope I have all my family and friends along for the ride, but that will not be my focus. Yeah, this is this is in a couple of, of other doctrine issues that I I think seen people struggle with. One is um, just the nature of church, and yeah. the other one I mean, even beyond the cultural issues, but just what is church, the church, and the other one is grace. Yes. Any thoughts? On the church area. Uh, yeah, you could be a Christian and sit home in your front room uh, and just read your Bible, but you are not fulfilling the picture of the Christian experience that we see in Scripture, which envisions the support of one another, that when I'm down, you're able to encourage me. When you're down, I'm able to encourage you. We help each other in our walk with God. When we have our bad times, our struggles in life, there's someone there to walk through it with us. And the Bible calls us to be there for one another, to strengthen them. And that becomes the family. And I think it was mentioned before by people here that, that the church is their family. I mean, you become connected to these people in your local congregation like family. We all need a support group, and the church is there for that. Uh, and hopefully you're, you're in a healthy church where you will find that kind of support. But uh, when Gerald and I left Mormonism, we visited around different churches, but we didn't have a church home. We did not actually commit ourselves to a church as members for uh, 
maybe nine years after we left Mormonism before we committed to a church. Membership was very hard for us. Mm -hmm. They, you know, once fooled, <laughs> and you just, you hold back on uh, that kind of commitment again, I, you know. Yeah. But we finally, the pastor talked to us, and we finally saw the value and the scriptural basis for being a part of a support group and uh, ministering to one another. I think many ex-Mormons float uh, and never settle down somewhere. You need to be in a consistent study group, mentoring under a pastor's direction, because that'll help you grow if you don't settle down to some place, it's easy to make your own religion uh, and and ignore certain parts <laughs> right. and just make it oh it's just you know whatever I want. Um, and I think there's a discipline to uh, going regularly to a particular congregation, being responsible to other people, being a support to other people. So we finally joined a church, but <laughs> it was uh, wasn't the first thing in our minds. <laughs> And that makes sense, given the nature of the journey. Now, you mentioned the things that happen in a church community like that, and one of them, you could be mentored or you could have a, a supportive community. I'm curious about what you think about, can a person who's never been LDS effectively mentor a former Mormon? And what would be the obstacles, if so? Well, I think they can, but they need to be someone who understands the issues because I find too often someone, especially if you get away from Utah, um, in other churches, they don't know enough about Mormonism. They don't realize our odd cultural hangups. And to a lot of church people, especially outside of Utah, there is this feeling of, yeah, it's, it's like uh, being Baptist and, and becoming Nazarene or becoming Presbyterian or something. You just switch churches. You know, like, get over it. What's your problem? <laughs> uh, or you are in a cult. Now move on. You know, And they don't understand there's a lot of family issues here that it isn't just changing your belief system. It's this cultural baggage and family, and we never get away from it. I still have Mormon family that are active in the church and wearing their garments. Uh, I'm sure I am a trial to them, but <laughs> uh, I remember a few years after I left the church, my sister thought she was being very uh, magnanimous and broad-minded. She said to me, Sandra, I just want you to know I can finally admit in Relief Society that you're my sister. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so there, there's just, you know, we got more baggage to deal with that a lot of times outsiders don't understand. However, hopefully in Utah, <laughs> uh, our church people have a better appreciation of that. But if they've been through studies to where they have a knowledge, I think they can be a mentor. But it takes a sensitivity to the cost these people are going to go through and the struggle, ongoing struggle, they'll have with their families. And many times people will say, well, just get over it. You know, we don't get over it because we don't walk away from everyone we love and know. So it's, but I think they can mentor if they have a understanding of the issues and have done some study into it. Right, so and, uh, they have to, an understanding and compassion kind yeah. of put together that that's really good. So when do you think, a former Mormon is ready to minister or to mentor other former Mormons? <laughs> we have to watch in putting former Mormons too quickly forward into ministry because we come with a lot of baggage and it's going to take time for us to sort that out. 
Uh, now, I think there's a little difference between being a mentor or buddy to someone coming out of Mormonism and being in a leadership position of, say, a support group or something. Right. Or even beyond that, maybe a public platform. A public platform, yeah. We have to be careful that you don't put someone forward too quickly into uh, public ministry because we just have things we need to settle and think through. It takes time. Uh, Gerald and I... <laughs> It took us a number of years just to figure ourselves where we were at and what we believed. Uh, I remember the first time a Christian asked me, uh, are you pre-trib or post-trib? And I'm like, what? <laughs> I've never heard these words, you know. So uh, it takes time to sort all these kinds of things out. I'm still working on that one, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so don't ask me. <laughs> but... Uh, there is a struggle there of getting to the point of uh, understanding where you came from enough to help somebody else. I think all of us, immediately after leaving Mormonism, becoming Christian, we have something to share with someone else. The question would be leadership. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So, you have hundreds of titles at the bookstore. Yes. <laughs> Just, I'd love to go in there and look around. If you haven't been there, you'll enjoy it. So um, give us a sense of maybe what might be some of the things that are in the store that would be the most helpful for someone mm -hmm. coming out who's kind of on a, this trajectory now. Um, maybe some of... Maybe a few things that might be helpful in different ways, but what might be the most helpful if if these guys were to show up? Uh, what would you point them to? Well, I think uh, we have several titles that are addressed specifically for the Mormon after they've accepted the Lord to go forward and find a church or how to go forward in Christianity after Mormonism. And uh, one is Janice Hutchinson's book, Out of the Cults and Into the Church. Um, and it's a very good, former Mormon, and she gives a very good overview and help to the person struggling to fit in to a church after Mormonism. And another one is um, a guy with the last name of Wallace, was it John, uh, does the book um, Starting at the Finish Line. Right. Meaning, the finish line is finishing with Mormonism, and now you're starting on your journey of faith. And uh, it helps you with understanding those steps and the things that you will struggle with as you leave. Uh, but we have uh, several different titles that would deal with those kinds of issues. Okay, that's helpful. And, and what's interesting that's new at the store? <laughs> um, well... We have several uh, former Mormons stories, uh, like Lisa today with her new book, and uh, Tracy uh, with Tenet with her book. There's uh, several helpful books of people coming out of Mormonism. So there's a whole gamut of uh, books on doctrine, personal experience, um, how do I navigate after the church, uh, books that give you uh, resources, like, um, where does it say that? So photos out of the Journal of Discourses with all kind of crazy things early church leaders said. Uh, you have Bill McKeever's book on uh, In Their Own Words, where you have quotes from the different Mormon authorities through the years on different topics, so that if you say something to someone, you can pull up a Mormon reference on it to show what the Mormon position is on something. Uh, so there's a lot of helpful things that way. There's all kind of historical studies that'll help you in uh, figuring out where Mormonism went astray and how to document it to your family. Okay, great. Helpful stuff. Um, two more questions, kind of finalizing. One final question for people who are on a journey and a, and a final question for people who want to help them. Okay, so, so what would be 
one more thing or one last thing that you would like to say to people who are on the journey out of Mormonism? What's a key thing for them? It gets better. You will cry less. There is hope. <laughs> there is life after Mormonism. You can find friends again. You'll have to recreate your family, possibly, <laughs> but uh, if you're in a Christian environment, you will find new friends that will be a real help <clears throat> to walk you through all of that. And th that's so exciting today because we didn't have any of that. <clears throat> I had no mentor. I had no friend. Uh, it was years before those things developed for us. Uh, so don't despair that where you're at today or where you're at with your family is the way it's going to always be. Through the years, we've seen many of our family come to faith in Christ. So it, it took time. I mean, we didn't see it overnight. But... Uh, both sets of our parents uh, made professions of faith in Christ before they died. Um, half of our families, of our siblings, have come out and become Christians. Uh, a lot of our cousins have become Christians. Some of our aunts and uncles have become Christians. But we're talking years. It's been 60 years, people. <laughs> But we've seen so much of that change in the family. The young reunions are no longer a Mormon gathering for our young uh, part of the young family. It's totally changed. Now the temple wearing, garment wearing crowd are the minority, not the majority. So uh, have hope, it will get better. And then what was the other yeah, one? Yeah, the other one is, so what would be one final thing that you would want to share with those who are interested in helping the former Mormons on their journey? Well, try to get involved in one of the uh, ministry groups that are doing outreach, uh, and there's several out in the lobby there that uh, you could come alongside with and read some of the different uh, books that they've put out on how to help mentor former Mormons. There is always a need for someone that's equipped and ready to understand the person coming out of Mormonism. And they will be coming into your church. They, it will happen. We are seeing a uh, steady stream of people coming out of Mormonism. There is a sense of disillusionment or emptiness for many people in Utah. And we need to prepare ourselves to be ready when they do walk in our door that we can offer them support, help, understanding, patience, and friendship. Uh, I mean, like I've said before, when I left, I was just so lonely. I lost everyone, all my friends, all my support group. And I would have given anything to have had a former Mormon or a Christian that understood Mormonism come alongside and invite me out for lunch, not coffee. I wouldn't have, <laughs> I, I wasn't ready for that yet. <laughs> but to have just uh, been a friend to invite us over or just to spend time with me. Uh, a friendly face is really important when all your whole family is beating up on you. <laughs> Amen. That's so true. So, Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your faithfulness over the years. Thanks for writing Shadow or Reality. Yeah. <laughs> which, um, amen. Which my girlfriend dumped on my lap in 1974 and um, let me, <laughs> me out. Um, and thanks for sharing with us today. Yeah. So great. Thank yeah. you much. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So be sure to stop by her table and, and uh, just some great titles there and then just have a chat.